For two years it had been notorious in the square that Samuel Dickey was thinking of courting Tnowhead Bell, and that if little Sanders Elshiner, which is the Thrums pronunciation of Alexander Alexander, went in for her, he might prove a formidable rival. Samuel was a weaver in the tenements, and Sanders a coal carter whose trademark was a bell on his horse's neck that told when coals were coming. Being something of a public man, Sanders had not, perhaps, so high a social position as Samuel, but he had succeeded his father on the coal cart, while the weaver had already tried several trades. It had always been against Samuel, too, that once when the kirk was vacant he had advised the selection of the third minister who preached for it, on the ground that it came expensive to pay a large number of candidates. The scandal of the thing was hushed up, out of respect for his father, who was a God-fearing man. But Samuel was known by it in Lang Tamas's circle. The coal carter was called Little Sanders, to distinguish him from his father, who was not much more than half his size. He had grown up with the name, and its inapplicability now came home to nobody. Samuel's mother had been more far-seeing than Sanders's. Her man had been called Sammy all his life, because it was the name he got as a boy, so when their eldest son was born, she spoke of him as Samuel while still in the cradle. The neighbors imitated her, and thus the young man had a better start in life than had been granted to Sammy, his father. It was Saturday evening, the night in the week when Ald Licht young men fell in love. Samuel Dickey, wearing a blue Glengarry bonnet with a red ball on the top, came to the door of a one-story house in the tenements, and stood there wriggling, for he was in a suit of tweeds for the first time that week, and did not feel at one with them. When his feeling of being a stranger to himself wore off, he looked up and down the road, which straggles between houses and gardens, and then, picking his way over the puddles, crossed to his father's hen-house and sat down. He was now on his way to the square. Epiphargus was sitting on an adjoining dyke, knitting stockings, and Samuel looked at her for a time. "'Ist your cell, Epi? he said at last. "'It's a that,' said Epi. "'Who's a we ye? asked Samuel. "'We're Jewist off and on,' replied Epi, cautiously. There was not much more to say, but as Samuel sidled off the hen-house, he murmured politely, "'Ay, ay. In another minute he would have been fairly started, but Epi resumed the conversation. Samuel, she said, with a twinkling in her eye, "'Ye can tell Lisbeth Fargus. I'll likely be drabbin' in on her, aboot Monday or Tuesday. Lisbeth was a sister to Epi, and wife of Thomas McQuatty, better known as Tnowhead, which was the name of his farm. She was thus Bells's mistress. Samuel leaned against the henhouse, as if all of his desire to depart had gone. "'Who do you kin, I'll be at the Tnowhead the nicht?' he asked, grinning in anticipation. "'Oo, I's warrant ye'll be after Bell,' said Eppie. "'I'm no say sure o' that,' said Samuel, trying to leer. He was enjoying himself now. "'I'm no sure o' that,' he repeated, for Eppie seemed lost in stitches. "'Samuel?' "'Aye?' "'You'll be spattering her soon, noo, I dinna doot?' This took Samuel, who had only been courting Bell for a year or two, a little aback. "'Who do you mean, Eppie?' he asked. "'Maybe you'll do it the nicht. "'Na, there's nae hurry,' said Samuel. "'Weel, we're a-coontin' on it, Samuel. "'Ge wa we ye. "'What for no?' Gay wa wi ye, said Samuel again. Bell's guy and fond o' ye, Samuel. Ay, said Samuel. But am dootin' your fell billy with the lasses. Ay, oh, I dinna ken. Moderate, moderate, said Samuel, in high delight. I saw ye, said Eppy, speaking with a wire in her mouth. Gain on terrible with Missy Haggart at the pump last Saturday. "'We was just to moose in ourselves,' said Samuel. "'It'll be nae amusement to Missy,' said Eppie, 
Gin ye brack her heart. Losh, Eppy, said Samuel. I dinna think o' that. Ye maun kin weel, Samuel. At there's mooney a lass wid jump at ye. Who? Weel, said Samuel, implying that a man must take these things as they come. For ye're a dainty child to look at, Samuel. Do ye think so, Eppy? Ay, ay. Oh, I didn't kin him anything but the ordinar. Ye may na be, said Eppy, but lasses does na do to be o'er particular. Samuel resented this and prepared to depart again. You'll no tell Bell that, he asked anxiously. Tell her what? About me and Missy. We'll see who ye behave yourself, Samuel. No, at I care, Eppy. Ye can tell her gin ye like. I wouldn't think twice o' telling her meself. The Lord forgive ye for Leon, Samuel, said Eppy, as he disappeared down Tammy Tash's clothes. Here he came upon Henders Webster. You're late, Samuel, said Henders. What for? Ooh, I was thinking you would be gay in the length of townhead the nicht, and I saw Sanders Elshiner making why there on oor sign. Did ye? cried Samuel, adding craftily. But it's naething to me. Todd lad, said Henders. Gin ye didn't buckle too, Sanders'll be carrying her off. Samuel flung back his head and passed on. Samuel, cried Henders after him. Ay, said Samuel, wheeling around. Gee bell a kiss fra me. The full force of this joke struck neither all at once. Samuel began to smile at it as he turned down the school wind, and it came upon Henders while he was in his garden feeding his ferret. Then he slapped his legs gleefully and explained the conceit to Willem Byers, who went into the house and thought it over. There were twelve or twenty little groups of men in the square, which was lighted by a flare of oil suspended over a cager's cart. Now and again a staid young woman passed through the square with a basket on her arm, and if she had lingered long enough to give them time, some of the idlers would have addressed her. As it was, they gazed after her, and then grinned to each other. "'Aye, Samuel,' said two or three young men, as Samuel joined them beneath the town clock. "'Aye, David,' replied Samuel. The group was comprised of some of the sharpest wits in Thrums, and it was not to be expected that they would let this opportunity pass. Perhaps when Samuel joined them he knew what was in store for him. "'Was you looking for Tnowhead's bell, Samuel?' asked one. "'Or maybe you was a wantin' the minister,' suggested another, the same who had walked out twice with Christy Duff and not married her after all. Samuel could not think of a good reply at the moment, so he laughed good-naturedly. Undutably, she's a snod bit critter, said David, archly. And Mitchy clever with her fingers, added Jamie Duchers. Man, I've thought of making up to Bell myself, said Peter Ogle. Would there be any chance, think ye, Samuel? I'm thinking she wouldn't hae ye for her first, Pete, replied Samuel, in one of those happy flashes that come to some men. But there's nae saying, but what she micht tak ye to finish up wi'. The unexpectedness of this sally startled everyone. Though Samuel did not set up for a wit, however, like David, it was notorious that he could say a cutting thing once in a way. "'Did ye ever see Bell red up?' asked Pete, recovering from his overthrow. He was a man who bore no malice. "'It's a sicht,' said Samuel, solemnly. "'Who will that be?' asked Jamie Duchars. "'It's weel worth your while,' said Pete." to ging a tower to the Tnowhead and see. You'll mind the closed-in beds, eat a kitchen? Aye, weel, they're a fell-spoilt crew, Tnowhead's litlins, and know that aisy to manage. The other lasses Lisbeth hain had a mitchy trouble with him. When they war in the middle of their redden up, the bairns would come tumbling about the floor. But, but, Sal, I assure ye, belled in a fash lang with them. Did she, Samuel? She did not, said Samuel, dropping into a fine mode of speech to emphasize his remark. I'll tell you what she did, said Pete to the others. She just lifted up the litlins, twa at a time, and flung them in the coffin beds, signed she snippet the doors on them, and kept them there till the floor was dry. 
Ay, men, did she so, said David, admiringly. I've seen her do it myself, said Samuel. There's no lassie max better bannocks this side of fetter lums, continued Pete. Her mither talked her that, said Samuel. She was a grand han at the bacon, Kitty Ogilvy. I've heard say, remarked Jamie, putting it this way so as not to tie himself down to anything. At Bell's, scones is equal to Mag Lunan's. So they are, said Samuel, almost fiercely. I kin she's a neat hand at Sinjin Hen, said Pete. And with ah, said Davit, she's a snod, canty bit of stocky in her Sabbath clays. If only thing, thick at the waist, suggested Jamie. I dinna see that, said Samuel. I dinna care for her hair either, continued Jamie, who was very nice in his taste. Something Mariallochi would be an improvement. A body kins, growled Samuel, at black hair's the boniest. The others chuckled. Pure Samuel, Pete said. Samuel, not being certain whether this should be received with a smile or a frown, opened his mouth wide as a kind of compromise. This was position one with him for thinking things over. Few old licks, as I have said, went the length of choosing a helpmate for themselves. One day a young man's friends would see him mending the washing tub of a maiden's mother. They kept the joke until Saturday night, and then he learned from them what he had been after. It dazed him for a time, but in a year or so he grew accustomed to the idea, and they were then married. With a little help, he fell in love just like other people. Samuel was going the way of the others, but he found it difficult to come to the point. He only went courting once a week, and he could never take up the running at the place where he left off the Saturday before. Thus he had not, so far, made great headway. His method of making up to Bell had been to drop in at Schnauhead on Saturday nights and talk with the farmer about the Rinderpest. The farm kitchen was Bell's testimonial. Its chairs, tables, and stools were scoured by her to the whiteness of Rob Angus's sawmill boards, and the muslin blind on the window was starched like a child's pinafore. Bell was brave, too, as well as energetic. Once Thrums had been overrun with thieves, it is now thought that there may have been only one, but he had the wicked cleverness of a gang. Such was his repute that there were weavers who spoke of locking their doors when they went from home. He was not very skillful, however, being generally caught, and when they said they knew he was a robber, he gave them their things back and went away. If they had given him time, there is no doubt he would have gone off with his plunder. One night he went to Tnowhead, and Bell, who slept in the kitchen, was awakened by the noise. She knew who it would be, so she rose and dressed herself, and went to look for him with a candle. The thief had not known what to do when he got in, and as it was very lonely, he was glad to see Bell. She told him he ought to be ashamed of himself, and would not let him out the door until he had taken off his boots so as not to soil the carpet. On this Saturday evening, Samuel stood his ground in the square, until by and by he found himself alone. There were other groups there still, but his circle had melted away. They went separately, and no one said good night. Each took himself off slowly, backing out of the group until he was fairly started. Samuel looked about him, and then, seeing that the others had gone, walked round the town house into the darkness of the bray that leads down and then up to the farm of Tnowhead. To get into the good graces of Lisbeth Fargus, you had to know her ways and humor them. Samuel, who was a student of women, knew this, and so, instead of pushing the door open and walking in, he went through the rather ridiculous ceremony of knocking. Sanders Elshiner was also aware of this weakness of Lisbeth, but though he often made up his mind to knock, the absurdity of the thing prevented his doing so when he reached the door. Tenowhead himself had never got used to his wife's refined notions, and when any one knocked, he was always started to his feet, thinking there must be something wrong. Lisbeth came to the door, her expansive figure blocking the way in. Samuel, she said. Lisbeth, said Samuel. He shook hands with the farmer's wife, knowing that she liked it, but only said, Ay, Belle, to his sweetheart. Ay, to Nowhead, to Mikwati, and it's yourself, Sanders, to his rival. They were all sitting round the fire, to now head with his feet on the ribs, wondering why he felt so warm, and Bell darning a stocking, 
while Lisbeth kept an eye on a goblet full of potatoes. "'Sit into the fire, Samuel,' said the farmer, not, however, making way for him. "'Na, na,' said Samuel. "'I'm to bide nay time.' Then he sat in to the fire. His face was turned away from Belle, and when she spoke he answered her without looking round. Samuel felt a little anxious. Sanders Elshiner, who had one leg shorter than the other, but looked well when sitting, seemed suspiciously at home. He asked Belle questions out of his own head, which was beyond Samuel, and once he said something to her in such a low voice that the others could not catch it. Tnowhead asked curiously what it was, and Sanders explained that he had only said, "'Aye, Belle, the morn's the Sabbath.' There was nothing startling in this, but Samuel did not like it. He began to wonder if he was too late, and had he seen his opportunity would have told Belle of a nasty rumor that Sanders intended to go over to the Free Church if they would make him Kirk officer. Samuel had the good will of Tnowhead's wife, who liked a polite man. Sanders did his best, but from want of practice he constantly made mistakes. Tonight, for instance, he wore his hat in the house, because he did not like to put up his hand and take it off. Tnowhead had not taken his off either, but that was because he meant to go out by and by and lock the byre door. It was impossible to say which of her lovers Belle preferred. The proper course with an old de classe was to prefer the man who proposed to her. "'You'll bide a wee and hae something to eat?' Lisbeth asked Samuel, with her eyes on the goblet. "'No, I thank ye,' said Samuel, with true gentility. "'You better. I dinna think it. Who'd say? What's to ender ye? We'll send you say pressin. I'll bide. No one asked Sanders to stay. Belle could not, for she was the servant, and now had knew that the kick his wife had given him meant that he was not to do so either. Sanders whistled to show that he was not uncomfortable. Aye, then. I'll be stapin' oar to the bray, he said at last. He did not go, however. There was sufficient pride in him to get him off his chair, but only slowly, for he had to get accustomed to the notion of going. At intervals of two or three minutes he remarked that he must now be going. In the same circumstances Samuel would have acted similarly. For a Thrums man it is one of the hardest things in life to get away from anywhere. At last Lisbeth saw that something must be done. The potatoes were burning, and Nowhead had an invitation on his tongue. Yes, I'll hate to be moving, said Sanders, hopelessly for the fifth time. Good nicht to ye, then, Sanders, said Lisbeth. Gie the door fling to a hent ye. Sanders, with a mighty effort, pulled himself together. He looked boldly at Bell, and then took off his hat carefully. Samuel saw with misgivings that there was something in it which was not a handkerchief. It was a paper bag glittering with gold braid, and contained such an assortment of sweets as lads bought for their lassies on the Muckle Friday. Hey, Bell, said Sanders, handing the bag to Bell in an offhand way, as if it were a trifle. Nevertheless, he was a little excited, for he went off without saying good night. No one spoke. Bell's face was crimson. Tnowhead fidgeted in his chair, and Lisbeth looked at Samuel. The weaver was strangely calm and collected, though he would have liked to know whether this was a proposal. Sit him by to the table, Samuel, said Lisbeth trying to look as if things were as they had been before. She put a saucer full of butter, salt, and pepper near the fire to melt, for melted butter is the shoeing horn that helps over a meal of potatoes. Samuel, however, saw what the hour required, and, jumping up, he seized his bonnet. "'Hang the taties higher up a joist, Lisbeth,' said he with dignity. "'I's be back in ten minutes.' He hurried out of the house, leaving the others looking at each other. "'What do ye think?' asked Lisbeth. "'I didn't kin,' faltered Belle. "'The taties is laying a coming to the boil,' said Tnowhead. In some circles a lover who behaved like Samuel would have been suspected of intent upon his rival's life, but neither Belle nor Lisbeth did the weaver that injustice. In a case of this kind it does not much matter what Tnowhead thought. The ten minutes had barely passed when Samuel was back in the farm kitchen. He was too flurried to knock this time, and indeed Lisbeth did not expect it of him. "'Belle, hey!' he cried, handing his sweetheart a tinsel bag twice the size of Sanders' gift. "'Losh preserves!' exclaimed Lisbeth. 
"'I's warrant there's a shilling's worth.' "'There's a that, Lisbeth, and mare," said Samuel, firmly. "'I thank ye, Samuel," said Belle, feeling an unwanted elation as she gazed at the two paper bags in her lap. "'You're over-extravagant, Samuel," Lisbeth said. "'Not at all,' said Samuel. "'Not at all. "'But I wouldn't advise you to eat the either ains, Belle. "'They're second quality.' Bell drew back a step from Samuel. "'How do you, kin?' asked the farmer, shortly, for he liked Sanders. "'I spired in the shop,' said Samuel. The goblet was placed on a broken plate on the table, with the saucer beside it, and Samuel, like the others, helped himself. What he did was to take potatoes from the pot with his fingers, peel off their coats, and then dip them into the butter. Lisbeth would have liked to provide knives and forks, but she knew that beyond a certain point Nowhead was master in his own house. As for Samuel, he felt victory in his hands, and began to think that he had gone too far. In the meantime, Sanders, little witting that Samuel had trumped his trick, was sauntering along the Kirkwind with his hat on the side of his head. Fortunately, he did not meet the minister. The courting of Tnowhead's bell reached its crisis one Sabbath about a month after the events above recorded. The minister was in great force that day, but it is no part of mine to tell how he bore himself. I was there, and I am not likely to forget the scene. It was a fateful Sabbath for Tnowhead's bell and her swains, and destined to be remembered for the painful scandal which they perpetrated in their passion. Bell was not in the kirk. There being an infant of six months in the house, it was a question of either Lisbeth or the lassie staying at home with him, and though Lisbeth was unselfish in a general way, she could not resist the delight of going to church. She had nine children besides the baby, and being but a woman, it was the pride of her life to march them to the Tnowhead pew, so well watched that they dared not misbehave, and so tightly packed that they could not fall. The congregation looked at that pew, the mothers enviously, when they sung the lines, Jerusalem is like a city, compactly built together. The first half of the service had been gone through on this particular Sunday without anything remarkable happening. It was at the end of the psalm which preceded the sermon that Sanders Elshiner, who sat near the door, lowered his head until it was no higher than the pews, and in that attitude, looking almost like a four-footed animal, slipped out of the church. In their eagerness to be at the sermon, many of the congregation did not notice him, and those who did put the matter by in their minds for future investigation. Samuel, however, could not take it so coolly. From his seat in the gallery he saw Sanders disappear, and his mind misgave him. With the true lover's instinct he understood it all. Sanders had been struck by the fine turnout of the Tanauhib pew. Bell was alone at the farm. What an opportunity to work one's way up to a proposal! Tnowhead was so overrun with children that such a chance seldom occurred, except on a Sabbath. Sanders, doubtless, was off to propose, and he, Samuel, was left behind. The suspense was terrible. Samuel's and Sanders had both known all along that Belle would take the first of the two who asked her. Even those who thought her proud admitted that she was modest. Bitterly the weaver repented having waited so long. Now it was too late. In ten minutes Sanders would be at Nowhead. In an hour all would be over. Samuel rose to his feet in a daze. His mother pulled him down by the coat-tail, and his father shook him, thinking he was walking in his sleep. He tottered past them, however, hurried up the aisle, which was so narrow that Dan'l Ross could only reach his seat by walking sideways, and was gone before the minister could do more than stop in the middle of a whirl and gape in horror after him. A number of the congregation felt that day the advantage of sitting on the left. What was a mystery to those downstairs was revealed to them. From the gallery windows they had a fine open view to the south, and as Samuel took the common, which was a short cut, through a steep ascent to Tnowhead, he was never out of their line of vision. Sanders was not to be seen, but they guessed rightly the reason why. Thinking he had ample time, he had gone round by the main road to save his boots, perhaps a little scared by what was coming. Samuel's design was to forestall him by taking the shorter path over the burn and up the commenty. It was a race for a wife, and several onlookers in the gallery braved the minister's displeasure to see who won. Those who favored Samuel's suit exultingly saw him leap the stream, while the friends of Sanders 
fixed their eyes on the top of the common, where it ran into the road. Sanders must come into sight there, and the one who reached this point first would get Bell. As Old Licks did not walk abroad on the Sabbath, Sanders would probably not be delayed. The chances were in his favor. Had it been any other day in the week, Samuel might have run. So some of the congregation in the gallery were thinking, when suddenly they saw him bend low and then take to his heels. He had caught sight of Sanders' head bobbing over the hedge that separated the road from the common and feared that Sanders might see him. The congregation who could crane their necks sufficiently saw a black object, which they guessed to be the carter's hat, crawling along the hedge top. For a moment it was motionless, and then it shot ahead. The rivals had seen each other. It was now a hot race. Samuel, dissembling no longer, clattered up the common, becoming smaller and smaller to the onlookers as he neared the top. More than one person in the gallery almost rose to their feet in their excitement. Samuel had it. No, Sanders was in front. Then the two figures disappeared from view. They seemed to run into each other at the top of the bray, and no one could say who was first. The congregation looked at one another. Some of them perspired, but the minister held on his course. Samuel had just been in time to cut Sanders out. It was the weaver's saving that Sanders saw this when his rival turned the corner, for Samuel was sadly blown. Sanders took in the situation and gave in at once. The last hundred yards of the distance he covered at his leisure, and when he arrived at his destination he did not go in. It was a fine afternoon for that time of year, and he went round to have a look at the pig, about which Nowhead was a little sinfully puffed up. "'Aye,' said Sanders, digging his fingers critically into the grunting animal. "'Quite so.' "'Grumph,' said the pig, getting reluctantly to his feet. "'Oh, eh, yes,' said Sanders thoughtfully. Then he sat down on the edge of the sty, and looked long and silently at an empty bucket. But whether his thoughts were of Tnownhead Bell, whom he had lost for ever, or of the food the farmer fed his pig, is not known. "'Lord preserves! Are ye new at the kirk?' cried Bell, nearly dropping the baby as Samuel broke into the room. "'Bell!' cried Samuel. Then Tnownhead Bell knew that her hour had come. "'Samuel?' she faltered. "'Will ye hae us, Bell?' demanded Samuel, glaring at her sheepishly. "'Aye,' answered Bell. Samuel fell into a chair. "'Brings a drink of water, Bell,' he said. But Bell thought that the occasion required milk, and there was none in the kitchen. She went out to the byre, still with the baby in her arms, and saw Sanders Elshiner sitting gloomily on the pigsty. "'Weel, Bell,' said Saunders. "'I thought he be at Kirk, Sanders,' said Bell. "'Then there was a silence between them. "'Has Samuel spired ye, Bell?' asked Sanders, stolidly. "'Aye,' said Bell again, and this time there was a tear in her eye. "'Sanders was little better than an aura man, and Samuel was a weaver, and yet... "'But it was too late now. "'Sanders gave the pig a vicious poke with a stick, "'and when it had ceased to grunt, Bell was back in the kitchen.' She had forgotten about the milk, however, and Samuel only got water after all. In after days, when the story of Bell's wooing was told, there were some who held that the circumstances would have almost justified the lassie in giving Samuel the go-by, but these, perhaps, forgot that her other lover was in the same predicament as the accepted one, that, of the two, indeed, he was the more to blame, for he set off to Nowhead on the Sabbath of his own accord, while Samuel only ran after him and then there is no one to say for certain whether Bell heard of her suitor's delinquencies until Lisbeth returned from the kirk. Samuel could never remember whether he told her, and Bell was not sure whether, if he did, she took it in. Sanders was greatly in demand for weeks after to tell what he knew of the affair, but though he was twice asked to tea to the manse among the trees, and subjected thereafter to ministerial cross-examinations, this is all he told." He remained at the pigsty until Samuel left the farm, when he joined him at the top of the bray, and they went home together. "'It's your cell, Sanders,' said Samuel. "'It is so, Samuel,' said Sanders. "'Very cold,' said Samuel. "'Lowy,' assented Sanders, after a pause. "'Samuel,' said Sanders. "'Aye.' "'I'm hearing you're to be married.' "'Aye.' "'Weel, Samuel, 
She's a snod bit of lassie. Thank ye, said Samuel. I'd answer kin a notion o' bell myself, continued Sanders. Ye had? Yes, Samuel. But I thought better o' it. Who do ye mean? asked Samuel, a little anxiously. Weel, Samuel, marriage is a terrible responsibility. It is so, said Samuel, wincing. And no thing to take up without consideration. But it's a blessed and honourable state, Sanders. Ye heard the ministrant. They say, continued the relentless Sanders, at the minister does not get on sair with the wife himself. So they do, cried Samuel, with a sinking at the heart. I've been telt, Sanders went on, at gin ye can get the upper hand of the wife for a while at first. There's the mere chance o' harmonious existence. Bells know the lassie, said Samuel, appealingly, to thwart her man. Sanders smiled. Do you think she is, Sanders? Weel, Samuel, I didn't want to fluster ye, but she's been o'er long with Lisbeth Fergus, not to have learned her ways, and abody kins what a life to now head has with her. Good sake, Sanders, who do ye no speak of this afore? I thought ye can't aught, Samuel. They had now reached the square, and at the U.P. Kirk was coming out. The old lick Kirk would be half an hour yet, but Sanders, said Samuel, brightening up, ye was on your way to spear her yourself. I was, Samuel, said Sanders, and I cannot but be thankful ye was o'er quick force. Gin it hadna been for you, said Samuel, I would never have talked o it. I am saying naething against Bell, pursued the other, but, man, Samuel, a body should be mere deliberate on a thing of the kind. It was Mitchy hurried, said Samuel, woefully. It's a serious thing to spear a lassie, said Sanders. It's an awful thing, said Samuel. But we'll hope for the best, added Sanders, in a hopeless voice. They were close to the tenements now, and Samuel looked as if he were on his way to be hanged. Samuel? Aye, Sanders. Did ye... Did ye kiss her, Samuel? Nah. Who? There was very little time, Sanders. Half an oar, said Sanders. Was there? Man, Sanders. To tell you the truth, I never thought o' it. Then the soul of Sanders Elshiner was filled with contempt for Samuel Dickey. The scandal blew over. At first it was expected that the minister would interfere to prevent the union, but beyond intimating from the pulpit that the souls of Sabbath prayers were beyond praying for, and then praying for Samuel and Sanders at great length, with a word thrown in for Bell, he let things take their course. Some said it was because he was always frightened, lest his young men should intermarry with other denominations, but Sanders explained it differently to Samuel. I have no word to say against the minister, he said. They're grand prayers, but Samuel, he's a married man himself. He's the better for that, Sanders, isn't he? Do you know see? asked Sanders compassionately, and he's trying to make the best of it. Oh, Sanders, man, said Samuel. Cheer up, Samuel, said Sanders. It'll soon be o'er. Their having been rival suitors had not interfered with their friendship. On the contrary, while they had hitherto been mere acquaintances, they became inseparables as the wedding day drew near. It was noticed that they had much to say to each other, and that when they could not get a room to themselves, they wandered about together in the churchyard. When Samuel had anything to tell Bell, he sent Sanders to tell it, and Sanders did as he was bid. There was nothing he would not have done for Samuel. The more obliging Sanders was, however, the sadder Samuel grew. He never laughed now on Saturdays, and sometimes his loom was silent half the day. Samuel felt that Sanders's was the kindness of a friend for a dying man. It was to be a penny wedding, and Lisbeth Fargus said it was delicacy that made Samuel superintend the fitting up of the barn by deputy. Once he came to see it in person, but he looked so ill that Sanders had to see him home. This was on the Thursday afternoon, and the wedding was fixed for Friday. Sanders, Sanders, said Samuel, in a voice strangely unlike his own. It'll a be o'er by this time the morn. It will, said Sanders. If I'd only kent her longer, continued Samuel. 
It would have been safer, said Sanders. Did you see the yellow floor in Bell's bonnet? he asked the accepted swain. Aye, said Sanders reluctantly. I'm Doton. I'm Sarah Doton. She's but a flitchy, licht hearted critter, after all. I had I my suspicions, Oot, said Sanders. Ye ha kent her longer than me, said Samuel. Yes, said Sanders, but there's nae getting at the heart o' women. Man, Samuel, they're desperate cunning. I'm doting it. I'm sire doting it. It'll be a warning to ye, Samuel. No to be in sick a hurry, e the future, said Sanders. Samuel groaned. You'll be gain up to the manse to arrange with the minister the morn's morning, continued Sanders, in a subdued voice. Samuel looked wistfully at his friend. I cannot do it, Sanders, he said. I cannot do it. Ye mon, said Sanders. It's easy to speak, retorted Samuel bitterly. We have at oor troubles, Samuel, said Sanders soothingly, and every man mun bear his ain burdens. Johnny Davy's wife's dead, and he's no repinning. Aye, said Samuel, but a death's no a marriage. We had hain deaths in our family, too. It may a be for the best, added Sanders, and there would be a michty talk i the hale countryside, gin ye didn't ging to the minister like a man. I moo a hay longer to think o' it, said Samuel. Bell's marriage is the morn, said Sanders decisively. Samuel glanced up with a wild look in his eyes. Sanders, he cried. Samuel? Ye have been a good friend to me, Sanders, in this sair affliction. Nothing ava, said Sanders. Don't mention it. But, Sanders, ye cannot deny but what you were ruining oot o' the kirk that awful day was at the bottom o' it eh? It was so, said Sanders bravely. And ye used to be fond o' Bell, Sanders. I didn't deny it. Sanders, laddie, said Samuel, bending forward and speaking in a wheedling voice. I a thought it was you she licked. I had some sick idea, Miss L, said Sanders. Sanders, I cannot think to pair to twa folk, say weel suited to ain and either, as you and Bell. Can I ye, Samuel? She would make you good wife, Sanders. I he studied her weel, and she's a thrifty, douce, clever lassie. Sanders, there's no other like her. Mony a time, Sanders, I hae say to mysel, there's a lass, ony man might be proud to tack. Abody says the same, Sanders. There's nae risk ava, man, nane to speak o. Tack her, laddie, tack her, Sanders. It's a grand chance, Sanders. She's yours for the spatterin'. I'll gee her up, Sanders. Will ye, though? said Sanders. What do ye think? asked Samuel. If ye would rather, said Sanders politely. There's my hand, aunt, said Samuel. Bless ye, Sanders. Ye've been a true freen to me. Then they shook hands for the first time in their lives, and soon after Sanders struck up the bray to Tnowhead. Next morning, Sanders Elishner, who had been very busy the night before, put on his Sabbath clothes and strolled up to the manse. But, where is Samuel? asked the minister. I must see himself. It's a new arrangement, said Sanders. What do you mean, Sanders? Bell's to marry me, explained Sanders. But, what does Samuel say? He's willing, said Sanders. And Bell? She's willing, too. She prefers it. It is unusual, said the minister. It's a richt, said Sanders. Well, you know best, said the minister. You see, the hoose was tain, at any rate, continued Sanders. And I'll do his ging in Tilton instead of Samuel. Quite so. And I couldn't think to disappoint the lassie. Your sentiments do you credit, Sanders, said the minister, but I hope you do not enter upon the blessed state of matrimony without full consideration of its responsibilities. It is a serious business, marriage. It's a that, said Sanders, but I am willing to stand the risk. So, as soon as it could be done, Sanders Elshiner took to wife to Nowhead's Bell, 
and I remember seeing Samuel Dickey trying to dance at the penny wedding. Years afterward, it was said in Thrums that Samuel had treated Bell badly, but he was never sure about it himself. It was a near thing, a michty near thing, he admitted in the square. They say, some other weaver would remark, and it was you Bell liked best. I didn't kin, Samuel would reply, but there's nae doot the lassie was fell fond o' me. Ooh, a mere passin' fancies, ye micht say. End of section 15